Um, so I want to share two things with you uh, this evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you may be. I saw one person uh, from New Mexico in the U.S. So uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, first thing I'll share at the end is, is uh, in the spirit of keeping true to this book I wrote about figuring things out. Um, I actually, about a year later, created a sort of visual, my own visual sketch notes for the entire book. So if you want a high level uh browse or, or navigation through the entire book. Um, I will share this at the end. And it's basically going chapter by chapter, like what chapter one is about, some of the key illustrations and images, and then you know what chapter two is about. And, and also in the layout, I chose to reflect how the chapters relate to each other. So you can kind of see the patterns. And so I'll share that at the end. Um, doesn't make for a great talk. It's useful to refer to or to like browse at your own pace to see if this book is of interest to you. Uh, but it doesn't make for a great talk. And so um, I'll share that later on. Uh, but what I want to share right now is more of a talk that gets to why I wrote the whole book and the, how it's actually changed um, the kind of work I do and how I work with others and those types of things. Um, so I'm going to put on keynote mode here and start Give me a presentation. Um, so in May 2020, uh, my book, Figure It Out, Getting from Information to Understanding, was published. And uh, to really get to what I mean by the difference between information and understanding, I want to show two different uh, illustrations. So I think a lot of things that, that we explore um, are, are very direct. There's a clean mapping between the information we're asking for and understanding. So if you have a question like, what time will my train arrive? Um, or how do you pronounce Kenevan? Or who wrote the book Fahrenheit 451? There's a very simple mapping. You can ask the question, you get an answer, and you understand it, right? Um, the problem is not everything is that clear. And so when you have questions like, should I buy a solar roof? Or um, this one's for all you machine learning folks out there. How is imitation learning different from supervised learning? Or what will the changes to the tax laws mean to me? Or how do I make sense of these configuration options, whatever it may be? Um, suddenly there's a lot more information that you have to work out and make sense of to create understanding. And that's really what the whole book is about. It's not about you know, the simple mapping. It's all about these more complicated, complex mappings. And uh, so the question that that begs then is how do we work with information to create understanding? And my co-author and I, uh, Carl Fast, my co-author, we talked a lot about information as a raw material or a raw resource that we have to learn how to work with in order to create understanding. It just doesn't just happen by accident. And uh, we wrote this book for designers. I think as designers, we do this all the time. Like we work with information to create understanding for others. But we also wrote it for anyone else who picked it up and read it um, because we want to enable anyone to be able to work with information to create understanding. And then a simple metaphor I used throughout the book was uh, this idea of a jigsaw puzzle. And it's almost like all the information or jigsaw puzzle pieces and what we need to learn how to do is how to snap it together, snap those pieces together to create understanding. So that's kind of the why we wrote the book and what the book's fundamentally about. Um, interesting thing as we sat down to write the book is it begged a question, how does understanding happen? And more fundamentally, where does understanding take place? And if you look at this photo, this is me playing a game with one of my boys. It's kind of an abstract strategy game, sort of like sort of like chess, uh, but a bit different. It's called uh, Centauri, and um, you see that we're we're. I don't know. I love the I love the sequence of photos because you can see just the agony, and he's like just thinking about things. And if I was asked a question, where does thinking or where does understanding take place? I think the answer in popular culture is in the brain, right? It happens in the brain. We see images of like Sherlock thinking through things. We have the thinking man from uh, you know, historical statues, right? And we, we tend to think of the brain as where understanding happens, which is fine. Um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But I think if we think all thinking happens and all understanding happens in the brain, that's when things can uh, go awry. And so what I wanna do next, I'm gonna share very quickly, I'm gonna share eight different images or photos and as I share these, and I'll go through one at a time, as I share these, I want you to think about these, and I want you to reflect on what they have in common. And in the spirit of sharing, if you want to add what, you, what, you, what patterns you see in the chat, please do that. Um, that would be fantastic. But yeah, as I go through each of these images, um, what do they have in common? And just I want to think about that. And that's going to that's gonna lay the groundwork for the discussion we have next. All right. So image number one. Uh, this is from a workshop. Uh, this is a 
card deck I created that people are playing with. They're they're challenging themselves. I love this photo because everyone's smiling, having a great time. Um, and this was actually it was a workshop in uh, not at a conference but at work. Uh, and when I worked for a financial institution, I just love seeing people having fun and playing at work. So this is a classic photo from historical archives. Um, this is a photo of. Um, Watson and Crick, who mapped the, or not didn't map, they created the model for human DNA. Um, I always have to mention Rosalind Franklin, who was a key part of this as well, even though she's not in the photo. Um, but what you see is the physical metal sculpture that they created and welded together to represent the, uh, the, the model of DNA that they had arrived at based on other data and other information. Okay. Um, this is a, a small team working together. It looks like there's a canvas or a structure of some sort on the wall, and they've they've put sticky notes on there. And if you zoom in really close, you could see that the sticky notes are color coded, so they each represent very specific types of information. And again, as I go through these, look for what these have in common. What are the commonalities you see? Um, this is kind of the same thing, but online in a tool like Mural, which I'm using today. Um, you see people doing a prioritization exercise and moving sticky notes around based on importance and feasibility. Okay, a little bit different. Uh, this is a group of folks sitting around the table playing a strategy uh, card game. In this case, it's the game Seven Wonders, if we have any board game enthusiasts out there. Lots of information on that table arranged in very specific ways. This one is a project from uh, Brett Victor. It's called Dynamic Land, and it's a vision for the future of computing. And in Dynamic Land, uh, people work, go into a physical space, and they're all part of the computing environment. And uh, you drop these pieces of paper. they are actually lines of, of code or, or, or commands. And so computing then becomes a physical, tangible thing uh, happening in physical space. It's also uh, something that anyone can participate on. So it's very cooperative and collaborative. All right, two more images to go. This is just an illustration uh, from the book. Uh, this is uh, an illustration of two uh, airline pilots. You can see they're there in the cockpit, all the controls, and you can see in the background also the, the tower that they're communicating with that's going to give them information they need to think about as they fly the plane. And then finally, let's go sci-fi for a moment. Uh, this is a scene from Iron Man 3, and you see Tony Stark doing a bit of a investigative sleuthing and, and uh, trying to figure out, you know, who set off the explosion. And you see him walking around this nice uh, VR hologram. He's chatting with his AI co-pilot Jarvis and, and working things out. So those are eight images. And whoops, let me go back. So I want to ask the question. I'll put them all there. What do these have in common? And I'm going to give you all about 10 or 20 seconds just to maybe add some stuff to the chat. And I'll see if I can view the chat while you're doing this as well. Oh, yeah, good. I can. Group thinking, people cooperating, high level visualization of info, teamwork. Yep. Acceptance, I love that. Sharing visual data, thinking in the physical space, different information. Love these, love these. They're all brainstorming. Systems, I love that as well. Collaboration around concepts. Aligning through artifacts, understanding through artifacts, love that as well. Noticing that there's artifacts in all of these pieces of information. Excellent. All right, we could keep going. I'm gonna I'm gonna reveal here uh, the kind of how I boil all this down to. I think in all of these, if we really speak in, in general language, we see people giving form to ideas. So in all of these cases, there's an abstract idea, some some bit of knowledge that's been giving form or representation in some way, whether it's a physical sculpture or sticky notes or cards in a game. Um, you know, there the ideas have begun form. 
um, you see people manipulating those forms. So they're not just staring at them, but they're actually working with them and moving things around and altering them and changing them. And they're doing this together. And you know, maybe the Iron Man's a bit of a stretch because you don't see other people, but you could argue Jarvis is sophisticated enough that he's another agent in the environment. But in general, you see people doing it together and they're doing it to solve complex problems. And that, that, that simple phrase, give formed ideas, manipulate those forms, do this together to solve complex problems. That's kind of what the book I wrote and kind of everything I'm, I'm interested in is all about. It's, uh, it's really just doing those things, giving formed ideas, manipulating the forms and doing this together. Let me dive back into outline mode here. Um, so if we go back to this image and we ask the question, where does thinking happen? I think the point I wanna make from all of those is that thinking is something that's spread across the brain, the body and anything in the world. And uh, this is straight from the book, a relatively simple problem with sufficient prior associations might actually be solved in your head as the expression goes. And an example of that would be if I asked everyone to multiply three times 11, you probably have enough prior associations that you can say, oh, that's 33. And in that case, absolutely, I would say thinking happened in your head, but did it always happen in your head? Was there a time when you were learning you know, math and, and that you would like count things or use counting beads or an abacus or some tool like that before you internalized it? And if it's a really complex or a more complicated math problem, like multiply 327 times 489, I'm willing to bet most of, us, most of us don't do that in our heads. We employ some resource in the environment. It could be pencil and paper. It could be a calculator. It could be a, uh, you know, a Google search, right? But we employ something beyond our brain to actually work out uh, the answer to this question. So that's the, that's the simple point I want to make about where does thinking happen, which is really important because once you grok this and once you, this makes sense, then it changes how we work with others in the work environment, or whether it's online or in person, what have you. And so uh, to, to really shine a spotlight on this, I want to give an illustration, an example. Let's imagine I asked you uh, if you wanted to play a game of chess. Uh, you know, I've been watching uh, Queen's Gambit. I'm excited about chess. Let's all play a game of chess together, right? Sounds exciting. Sound good? So, um, except there's one catch. Instead of uh, the normal game of chess, let me go out of presentation mode here. Instead of the normal game of chess, um, we're going to play it over SMS. And at this point, you're like, wait, what? Like, you were looking forward to playing a nice, real game of chess. And now I just told you we're going to play it over, over text messaging, uh, SMS. And at this point, when I hold up SMS, it highlights something that I think we often take for granted in the game of chess, which is um, when you have all those pieces in that board, um, that board and those pieces are holding information in a way that supports reflection, reveals patterns, and supports interactions. You can pick up the piece, move it around, do things like that. Um, and those are important, each of those lines. Supports reflection, reveals patterns, and supports interaction. Um, but, you know, our text message version isn't all bad. It's got some inherent value as well. And so I think if I was to take this illustration a step further and say, okay, actually forget, forget SMS. We're just going to play it over Zoom, staring at each other, and we're just going to use our memory, right? And just, we'll just have to remember the moves. Then suddenly we see the value of the SMS version and at least, at least it offered a record of information that we could refer back to. We could actually see the information. It's like, what was that move five moves ago? And the reason I share all this, oh yeah, and then that the one on the far left, you know, just talking about it requires serious concentration and serious recall of all that's been said. And when you line all these up next to each other, you kind of see that, you know, when we give form to ideas or give ideas form, like in this case, an SMS, it enhances our ability to think about them. And when we actually take the time then to arrange those forms and allow those <laughs> forms to be manipulated, i.e. with the chessboard, then we can support more complex thinking. Powerful stuff, right? And then here's the question I like to ask next. Think about the last serious disagreement you got into, or think about a big decision that you recently made. And think back to that continuum from just talking about it to taking notes, to actually thinking about a framework or a canvas or some way to structure those notes. And I'm willing to bet many of us just talked about it or argued about it, you know, and debated and used, used language. And I think that's because we have this idea that um, this is how we think, right? We think in our brains, we try to get ideas out. We try to, hopefully we communicate them 
well enough that other people get it and they don't stuff isn't lost in translation and we go back and forth that's that's this idea um and I guess what I would challenge us to think about is where does that idea come from? And if you go back to the 1940s and information theory, um, if you look at this model, it says, hey, people are information sources. They transmit information and uh, you know that goes out as a signal. And in between that signal area, that's where noise comes in, where, peop- where things are lost in translation. And I would actually argue, if you go back to all eight of those photos I shared, by giving ideas form in a structured way, actually you're clarifying things and there's less uh, chance for information to be lost in translation if you know how to work with information in that way. If you know how to give, like in this case example, how to color code sticky notes and how to arrange them in a specific way, you can actually create understanding um, in a way that just language alone doesn't. So when I talk about where does understanding take place and why that's so important, that's that's the argument right there. Um, So to tie up a ribbon on this section, We wanna give form to ideas, we wanna manipulate those forms and we wanna do it together. And this is a a quote directly from the book. Um, Understanding is about a system of resources distributed across the environment and then dynamically assembled to perform the activity and achieve a goal. So that is what I wanna dive more deeply into for the remainder of the time. And let's just use that idea of giving form to ideas, manipulating those forms and doing this together to solve complex problems as our outline. And I wanna give you like eight or nine takeaways. Uh, We'll go through these really quickly because again, I wanna leave lots of room for conversation. So uh, some of you may have seen this illustration. I can't remember who it originated with, but I I, I love it. It's It's a great simple illustration for the power of visuals. Um, When we all sit and talk about something, and we may think we agree because of language, but uh, uh, yeah, Jeff Patton, someone said, came up with it. Great. Um, But when we actually take the time to draw what we're thinking about, then we realize, oh, gosh, you were thinking of a square. I was thinking of a circle. And she was thinking of a triangle. Oh, we're not in alignment. So then you can have that conversation. And then it brings clarity. And you can actually agree. So I love that illustration. Um, I love the chess one that I shared. Let me give you another illustration that I picked up uh, recently that I think is also really powerful. I'm going to um, I'm going to read through this this statement here, and it's a very it's a description of a very simple organization. It's their org structure, but I'm going to ask you to answer three questions at the end of this. Okay, so let me just read this through. Pay attention, um, and I'll ask you three very direct questions. Jenny is the head of humanities faculty. Fatima is the head of the history department. Tom, Joe, and Sue work for Fatima. Harry is the head of the geography department. Joe, Shaz, and Tanya report to Harry. Sue, Joe, Shaz, and Harry are working together on the joint modern Europe project. This is always just hard to read. Like, ah, it's, it's, Pretty simple, but it sounds like a nightmare just reading it. But, but but let's just jump to the questions, all right? And I'll even let you refer to the questions in the text. So who is the highest ranking person on the Modern Europe project? That's question one. Um, question two, which people are not involved with the Modern Europe project? And uh, question three, which department has the most people on the Modern Europe project? All right, all right. Don't, I'm not going to make you wrestle with this too long. Um, I think those of you who are taking the time to answer this, you're probably mentally constructing an org chart so you can see the relationships. But imagine how much different it is if I just skip that verbal description and just show you the org chart and then ask you the question. So let's ask them again. Who is the highest ranking person on the Modern Europe project? Harry, right? Here's the Modern Europe project grad. Harry is the highest ranking person. Which people are not involved with it? We can just look at everyone here is the, the dark charcoal gray color. And then which department has the most people on the modern year project? Oh, that's easy. The geography department. And the whole point that is when we give information form, in this case, in the form of an org chart, we're able to see those relationships so much more powerfully. And so the punchline of, of both of those is that um, even simple visual representations, even simple visual representations can dramatically improve comprehension. 
All right. And I want to give one more example, one more thing as well. So the book is largely about more about humans than it is about screens and pixels and things like that. And that's because there are lots of great books on, you know, how to design like data visualizations, for example, or how to design forms. And I wanted to get back to why this is as human creatures. And, um, you know, and we had visual spatial representation long before we had screens or even books, or we had, you know, ways of seeing things. And so the second point I want to make around giving form to ideas is that visual representations aren't just two dimensional, um, that uh, it can be any sort of visual stand in. And this example, it's an illustration from the book, but it actually came from a, uh, I was catching up with a friend over lunch and, um, uh, she started telling me all about this really complicated space in the pharmaceutical industry and companies that sit behind companies that you've never heard of and all this stuff. And it was clear I was getting confused. And so she grabbed some salt and pepper shakers, said, okay, imagine the salt shaker is the this big company that you have heard of. And now this pepper one is the one that's behind it that you've never seen. And the sugar packet is the deal here. And she started using these visual stand-ins and it, I got it. It was like, great. I had something to refer back to these things to hold information. And then I was able to grab things like the spoon and say, so in this scenario, if the spoon goes over here, then what does that mean? And so we were able to converse about a very complicated topic just by using some visual stand-ins. So visual representation doesn't always just mean things on a screen or static or flat. Um, it can mean 2D representations. And thinking that way, by the way, prepares us for things like VR or augmented reality or other things. When we think about manipulating information in space. All right. Um, so we're going to do a game next. Let me, let me center this properly here. Um, it's an exercise where we're going to count some coins. And I've got a photograph with some, some American coins here. Um, I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Uh, but recognizing that I am presenting mostly to people outside the US, I thought it'd be good just to give a quick primer on the different values, the different types of coins you're going to see in their values, because the question you're going to answer is how much money is on the table? How much, you know, what's that add up to, right? That's the question. So the biggest coins are quarters. They're worth 25 cents. Um, then in terms of value size, you have dimes. They're the smallest, but they're worth 10 cents. Don't ask me why. It makes no sense. Um, then you have nickels, which are slightly smaller than quarters, but bigger than a penny. Um, they're worth five cents. And then you have uh, uh, pennies, which are worth a penny, uh, uh, right? So that's uh, just a rundown of American currency coins. You're going to see a photo with a bunch of coins on it. And the challenge is to add this up and be the first person to answer correctly with how much change is in the picture on the table. And some, it's not a trick question, so don't include these coins in the, in the guide on the left. It's, it's nothing like that. Just, just keep it focused on the photo. And uh, there's one other trick I want you to do, one other thing, and honor policy, you're going to have to do this on your own. Um, I don't want you like pointing at your screen or using your hands in any way. And in fact, if it helps to sit on your hands so they're not involved, like I just want you using your eyeballs and just staring at this. Okay, deal? All right, so the first person who can correctly answer how much change is on the table is the winner. Um, this normally takes about two minutes, so a little over two minutes. So if, if it's quiet for an extended period of time, it's okay. Everyone's furiously trying to figure out the answer to this. I'm going to start the timer in just a minute. Everyone ready? Everyone ready? All right, here we go. Count the coins. And when you think you have the correct answer, type it in the chat box, and I will I will let let you know when someone's typed the correct answer. Three dollars, you got to include change as well if there's any change. Not two sixty. Oh, they're coming in fast now. 
Yay, yay, we got a winner. Wow. So, so three dollars and a penny. Jason, Jason Reynolds, you got that. Jason, just type in the chat. Where are you from? I'm curious. See if you had a, a, a US bias or not or anything. Or that that's actually the fastest that any group has done this. So amazing. Boston. All right, all right. All, all of you in, in, in uh, all over the world can be like, ah, yeah, three dollars and a penny. Um, all right, why did I share that? So um, this was actually a study that was done at a university years ago. And there's, by the way, if you want to see how it added up to $3 and a penny, there's, there's the answer. And um, they brought in two, they had two groups of people. So they had the, the normal, the baseline group, and they had the money, the change on the table. And they said, just count the change. And they, they tracked how quickly people counted the change. But then they also watched and observed what people did. And as you would expect, people interacted with the change, interacted with the coins. So they would, you know, maybe count them over. So you'd go from one site uncounted to counted. Sometimes people would stack them by the denomination, like stack the pennies, stack the quarters, stack the dimes and count it that way. So there were different strategies, but um, in all cases, people interacted with the change in some way. They, they move things around, manipulate it. So that was the control group. And then the second group, the no hands group, uh, they asked that group to do the same thing, but they asked that they sit on their hands, that they put, you know, put them under the bottom and just sit on their hands so their hands were not involved. And as you would expect, um, the group that could use their hands not only got the, the answer more quickly, but they were more often more accurate. So, um, so the simple point there is that you know, even simple interactions can improve performance and reduce mistakes. So when I talk about interacting with or manipulating information, um, you know, there's studies to back up why when we can interact with stuff, it, it's more important. And there's, you know, what, what Carl and I talk about in the book is that um, interactions aren't just something we, we, uh, we, you know, our brain thinks about and tells our body to do, but actually we interact or we construct knowledge through interactions. Like we work with the world to create knowledge. And so two quick examples of that. If you've played the game of Scrabble, um, quite often people will rearrange the Scrabble tiles and the reason we do that is to see possibilities. And if all thinking happened in the brain, we would just look at those six or seven tiles and we would mentally scramble them. But it's actually kind of hard to do that. So we rearrange tiles to see more possibilities. Going back to the chess example, um, in chess, it's permitted to grab a piece, hover over a potential option. And as long as you don't release the piece, let go of it, you can return it and you, you haven't committed to that move. Um, and in fact, if you play chess on ch the app chess.com, they allow you to, you know, put, you know, explore a possible move and then undo it before you actually commit to it. And there's power there, right? When you're able to hover that piece, you're able to see more moves in advance and think more deeply. And if, if you see, ooh, that would be a mistake, you can return it. Well, if all thinking happened in our heads and we just told our bodies what to do, we wouldn't need to do that. But we're actually thinking by interacting with stuff in the world. And so it's... it's uh, the difference between thinking then doing, which is a traditional cognitive science kind of belief, and thinking versus thinking through doing. So we think when we interact with the world. By the way, if you run any kind of workshop or facilitation and you're wanting to get people thinking, like this is why it's important to hand a marker to people and say, you draw or you do your notes, right? You don't want just passive participants uh, watching and observing. You want people participating and interacting because that's part of the thought construction process. All right. Um, there's other benefits to manipulating information as well. So uh, uh, I imagine a lot of us have been in some kind of design thinking workshop and there's a hidden value of design thinking workshops that I don't think gets talked about often enough. And um, you know, if, you, if you've been in a workshop, you often will brainstorm, right? You'll get a bunch of sticky notes on the wall and then you'll do some sort of exercise. A clustering one is often pretty common, like where you'll group like things, you'll do affinity clustering. Um, so you'll see things like that. And then it might be great those affinity clusters are nice. Let's sort those st same sticky notes into a timeline. Uh, let's you know put them on a sequence of events from first to last, right? Um, or, and then it might, you might say, okay, let's pivot again. Let's rearrange those same sticky notes on a matrix. And it might continue this way. And I think a lot of times we focus on how the sticky notes get arranged, you know, the clusters, the timeline, the matrix, the canvases, what have you. But the invisible or the hidden value in these 
is you can take a single object like this one sticky note and you start to see that same object in different ways through different lenses and different perspectives. And you're able to shift your perspective by changing the framework, quite literal framework that has been used to organize these things. And uh, so yeah, interactions that shift views, let us also shift perspectives. In a more literal way, we see this with tools like Airtable, Coda, Zenkit, where, you know, to use one of the quotes, everyone gets their way. So with Airtable, everything, it's, it's ultimately a database tool, but they offer all these views, like a dozen or more views, where you can have the Trello loving you know, card view, or the Gantt chart view, or the spreadsheet view, or the Pinterest card style view. And by pivoting your view, you can see the information you want emphasized, but it's the same body of information. It's the same set. And um, it's powerful. Like I've worked in places where um, we are beholden to older tools. We're committing to the tool meant committing to one view. I've worked in places where we were using tools like Airtable, Zenkit, and Coda, and we could pivot our views on the same set of information. And it was so much better for shared understanding and dialogue and things like that. So again, interactions that shift views, let us also shift perspectives. And then finally, I just want to give a, a teaser from the book. We have a whole chapter where we talk about um, timeless interaction patterns. And when we say timeless, we're talking timeless, like thousands, you know, perhaps millions of years, like interaction patterns that go back, like predate anything we were doing with screens or computers or even paper. And so the types of patterns we talk about are things like searching, probing, animating, collecting. Uh, cloning is one that's newer with digital, but, you know, and actually the printing press, right? But most of these are just natural human things we do. So you take something like annotating, and when you, you know, star something in a social media app, so you remember it later on, that's annotating. Um, but when you make a mark on a tree so you can remember your path and how you got there, that was also annotating. And so we take a look at these timeless interaction patterns, and this we feel like is a really powerful way to focus on human interactions, even as media and modalities change. And so, you know, we've had command line interfaces, we've had graphical user interfaces, we've had the advent of glass and moving things behind glass. We have VR and, you know, the whole new paradigm there, but these interactions are, are there. It's just how they show up and how they manifest is a little bit different each time. So this is, we felt like it's a really powerful, timeless way to think about how humans interact with information. Um, finally, so that's, that's the manipulating those forms part of this talk, um, doing this together. Let's talk about the social part of this. Um, so something I have become increasingly aware of is just, um, you know, how our brains work and the importance of, of trying to create something like how my brain alone or all of our brains alone work, but actually externalizing that. And if you, uh, well, I, I grabbed these three illustrations for a reason. So this is from a lot of like, this is an illustration from like that you see from a lot of crime shows where someone will create the crazy serial killer wall, right? Or, or the detective wall where they're trying to see all the connections. And even though we laugh about this and it's almost a, a cliche now in detective shows, there's something powerful to it, right? Because you're taking knowledge, you're mapping it, and you're able to see patterns and reveal things. Um, our brains, when you, you know, at the highest level, when you just study what the brain's all about, it's a bunch of neurons firing together and wiring together, and it's just connections. And oftentimes what we think is the right solution or, or what's the best solution is really just what's familiar, what feels comfortable, what's, you know, like something that's fired before. But we have all these connections and all these neurons firing and wiring. And then if you look at this, this is an export from, I believe it, I can't remember if it was Rome or Obsidian, this exact screenshot, but these are, you know, progressive modern note-taking tools that actually surface serendipitous connections between things because they use backlinks. And I look at all of these, I'm like, it's really about making these connections. Um, that's where a lot of ideas and insights and, you know, new things come from. And, you know, the punchline there is more connections equal more possibilities. And so what I'm always trying to do when I'm in the room with folks is I recognize that, you know, if there are three of us in a room, we each bring, you know, decades worth of prior experiences that we've had. And if I can create an environment where we can somehow manage to get our ideas out and we can share them, if I can create the psychological safety where we feel free to share ideas, even if they seem like crazy, there are more connections and more connections equal more possibilities. So that's uh, connections build and compound knowledge too. And this is where we get to how, how do we enable that? 
Um, if you were to have spoken with me maybe seven to eight years ago, I would have talked about uh, things like winning hearts and minds, how to be persuasive and compelling and inspiring. And there's certainly a place for that. But now my core value is more about working and learning together. So when I walk into a room, you know, I have ideas I want to share and stuff, but I'm also, you know, I'm asking myself, what do I want to learn from this group? What can I learn? Um, and I'm trying to be open to that. Um, and it's a difference between, you know, communication, communicating idea and collaborating, like creating a space where people can collaborate. And fundamental to this is uh, starting from a place of curiosity and recognizing that um, there's stuff to learn from everyone. Everyone has these amazing prior experiences. And so there's a challenge here, and this is what I get to do every day at work, um, use my visual superpowers to bring people into a dialogue around complex topics. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot I could go into here. I'll just cherry pick a few of these sticky notes. Um, when you bring ideas out and give them form, uh, like I've been talking about, there's less room for misunderstanding because, you know, you can see different ideas, uh, problems are solved together. I love that it's more democratic. So you could have a group of 10 people. One of them could be the CEO, the founder, another one could be the intern. And that really doesn't matter. It's an idea that's uh, worthy of consideration. So that case it emphasizes ideas ahead of people in a healthy and a, in a good way. Um some questions to ask, um, <laughs> kind, of, kind of a facetious questions. But I asked these a, a few years ago. Do I work with people? Do those people think differently from me? Do those people have unique and valuable experiences? And does success depend upon us working together? And if the answer is yes to all of these, which I think it is 99% of the time, then we need to learn how to create spaces for visual collaboration spaces where we can all work together. Um, I just saw say, someone say, what about hippos? Um, I, democratic, flatten it. Like we all need to work together, right? Um, I think the intern has as much great ideas as the hippo, right? It's put the ideas ahead of the, the roles and the placement. Uh, and I can talk about in the Q&A how to do that if you want. Um, so finally, active learning, uh, well, finally, fine. Active learning is fun. Um, active learning and playing together is fun. And this is how I try to approach everything I do. Um, Another, I've been talking a little bit longer, another interaction point. Look at this meeting A I just shared and just in the chat, um, uh, describe what you, what you see there. And yes, and someone asked, what, by the way, someone said hippo, someone else asked, what does hippo mean? Can you explain it? And someone else answered, like, this is what I'm talking about in action, right? Like collective learning, learning from the group. Fantastic. All right. Describe what you see in meeting A. Yeah. Monologue. No one paying attention. Presentation. No focus. One person leading a session. Story of my life. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, it's painful, huh? Um, wasted time. Boring. All right. What about this one, meeting B? So shifting gears a bit, what do you see in meeting B? Cooperation, everybody pitches in, teamwork and more people engage, co-learning, love this, love it. Thinking together. Future, yes, yes. I hope this is the future. Play, yes. Love it, love it. Um, so from a cognitive perspective, I, I like to say this first scenario, meeting A, is really all about passive learning. I think someone said it's one person who's done all the work of learning, forcing what they've learned on others. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, and then in the uh, and I fully own the irony of that as I monologue here, so I, <laughs> I accept that, but we're going to have time for Q&A. Um, what I love about the, the meeting B is, is it's, there's active learning. The people in the room are learning together, and if anything, there's a facilitator to add structure. Um, this is what I try to bring to companies everywhere in, in my job um, and what I do. It's a more playful approach to work. And... Um, you know, it's, it's the idea of rethinking uh, uh, meetings as games. In fact, our, I, I work at Mural and our CEO talks about no more meetings, let's have more games. And he means specifically, let's bring games to how we work and how we work together. So uh, that's, that's a lot more on the doing this together, the, the social part. 
I want to land on one final point. Um, none of this happens by accident. It all has to be designed. Um, it doesn't just happen. Like the chessboard, going back to that example, someone had to create a chessboard that holds information. We, when we create customer journeys or we introduce a, a blue uh, business model innovation canvas or do all these things, like we're designing the cognitive environment in which the conversation is going to happen. And so one, one, another thing that's become a mantra for me in recent years is just enough structure and no more. Um, and, and I've really gotten into this topic of what facilitation is and what facilitation means. Uh, in fact, I wrote an article on that was published on Adobe Max a couple of years ago, where I basically say, I believe the future of design is about facilitation and designers becoming facilitators and facilitating dialogue and understanding around really complex topics. Um, and my definition of facilitation is, is very simple. It's creating the conditions, however that takes shape, creating the conditions that enable people to work together for a desired outcome. And there's lots under in there that we could unpack, but yeah, basically creating the conditions that enable people, groups of people to work together for a desired outcome. And uh, that's, that's what I try to do all the time. And just to unpack that a bit more. So I, I love this quote. This was speaking specific about teaching in the classroom. I just changed the word teacher to facilitator and architecture to structure, and it, it works just as well. Inquiry at its best happens when the facilitator is doing very little other than creating the structure for the experience to happen. And I think that's increasingly, I see that definitely as my role as a facilitator, but also my role as a designer. Um, one, one thing to unpack there is structure can mean a lot of things. So structure can mean creating a psychologically safe place where people feel free to speak up. And by the way, I think some people have misinterpreted psychological safety as everyone being nice to each other or kind. That's not it. There are teams where people will drop the F-bomb and cuss at each other and shout at each other, but they feel safe because they know they're not going to be thought less of or rejected because of their ideas. And psychological safety really just means I can speak up and share my ideas freely and not worry about how I will be judged later on. Um, there is structures, environmental conditions. And you know, going back to pre-COVID, um, we would have talked very specifically about the design of the physical room. How do we arrange chairs? How do we arrange the tables? What's the temperature of the room? Um, the height of the ceiling, all, that, all these types of things. I think designing the environmental conditions is even more important as we've moved online. And we have to think about the pros and cons of different online tools and what that means. There was some, I think some people are asking about audio problems and chopping us earlier on in the chat. And like, that's part of the environment we're in, right? There's a structure in which we met. Um, Avi choosing to use Eventbrite to sign up and then Zoom to host this and me choosing Mural. These are all like online environments that we're choosing to use for this, this convening, this dialogue. And then finally, and this is the stuff that I, I talk a lot about, methods and activities, structure through creating structure through methods and activities. And that gets to things like um, visual structures, so like I mentioned the business model canvas, something as simple as like a Kanban board to do, doing, done. Um, empathy math canvases, customer journey maps, start, stop, continues, you know, polarity maps. So all these things that organize and structure ideas, these visual structures, there's a lot of those. There's generative questions. So some of you may have done, uh, you know, at the beginning of a project, you may do a pre-mortem where you imagine it's two years from now and this project failed, what went wrong? And it's a fun question. It's an imagination one, but also it's powerful because if you have a brand new team, um, and new people who've met, you don't want to voice your concerns because you might be looked at as a negative person or someone who's not really committed to the project when in fact you really are. You just want to talk about these sensitive things. And so this exercise, imagine the project failed, why, gives people a space to speak up and talk about those things at the beginning of the project, which is when you want to hear it. Um, I've seen people use Mad Libs where uh, the Mad Libs statements were pretty neutral and people could fill it in however they want. And they would fill it in in a way that allowed them to talk about, uh, you know, deep concerns. So generative questions that provoke conversation in a healthy way. Um, you have things like artifacts, like card decks. If you know me, I love talking about card decks of all kinds, toolkits. Um, a lot of these in the photos are ones that I've made and used in my workshops. Um, this is 
not mine, this bottom one here. This is an artifact from the future where you, you basically you grab uh, cards from three suits and you get this mashup of ideas. And so in this case, it's in an ambitious city. There is a situation related to big data. What is it? And you brainstorm the answer and talk about those ideas. Um, so artifacts of all kinds, um, sticky notes themselves, and the way you arrange them as a type of, of artifact. And then exercises that involve like group play and improv and things like that. This is a exercise I've done in the past where I'd have people role play the browser and you would have a dialogue with the interface as a way to unearth uh, really nuanced details about the, the UI and the design of it. And the person role playing the browser could only use what's written in the script, right? So it's a good way to evaluate an existing interface like for a form and stuff. So group play. And then there's invisible stuff. Just how do we create the, the safety? How do we flow or transition from one place to another? So um, all of that to say, none of this happens by accident. It has to be designed. Just enough structure, no more. So that final, if we zoom back out, the big thing I want you to take away from this talk is give form to your ideas, manipulate those forms, do this together to solve complex problems. And when I say complex problems, it could be things like I opened with, should I buy a solar roof? How is imitation learning different from supervised learning? Um, what will the changes to the tax laws mean for me? It could be stuff like that. It could be things like the, the, the big 17 like global sustainable development goals, zero hunger no poverty, climate action, um, life on land, like it could be things like that, or to kind of bring it back down something maybe closer to home. Here are common work challenges that I know many of us and me especially I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with. So how do we collaborate across time zones? How do we think about a seamless experience across applications and integrations? How might we nurture, I think this is a big one, how might we nurture a culture of asynchronous collaboration? So as we have more people distributed who can't meet at the same time, how do we nurture async collaboration. Um, how might we support, support a work from anywhere workforce? Um, how might we bring more joy to meetings? <laughs> That's a fun challenge to work on. How might we create better onboarding experiences? How do we create space for deep focus? What's the best way to prioritize time and resources? So these are, these are common like work challenges that I see a lot of companies wrestling with right now. Um, so to bring some closure to the talk portion of this, give form to ideas, manipulate those forums, do this together and have some fun. Um, because I feel like when we bring ideas into the world in a thoughtful, structured way, we extend our ability to think about, interact with, and discuss complex topics. With that, thank you very much. All right. Wow. Steven, Steven it was packed. A lot of things going on, but... Uh... Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I want to say also that, I mean, it's a part of a book, all of this information. And uh, there is also a coupon code if anyone wants to get the book, uh, right? Uh, yeah, there is. Thanks for reminding me of that. Yeah, if you're interested in the book, which dives into this a lot more deeply, it's uh, FIO20. I'll type that in the chat. Um, FIO for figure it out. 20. I don't know if it's 20% off or if that's from 2020 or what, but yeah, FIO20. We'll give you a discount from Rosenfeld Media. Let me let me pull that up really quickly. I don't. Okay. In, in the meantime, I will introduce Anfisa Bog. I don't know how to say a last name. Anfisa is. You a don't person. have to. It's okay. Ah, I've been following Anfisa for a while now on Instagram. If you're not following her, I will post in the the Instagram. She posts amazing stuff and it's always interesting. And Anfisa, Chief Curiosity Officer and uh, Vitaly. <laughs> Uh, bomb away. I want you to ask the toughest questions. Let's see. Atisa, go first. Oh, gosh. <laughs> toughest question is tough to ask, <laughs> isn't it? Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to say that was great. I love the interactivity of the whole presentation. I love that you were trying to involve us. So it's actually a great example in practice. Um, as you were talking about all those concepts, introducing them and trying to engage us. Of course, I think, and probably many of us were still curious, you know, as to how do we apply it in real life? How do we make it practical? How do we, so learning all this information and kind of building the concepts, what are the actual steps? How do we make sure that we understand what you were talking about? And of course, I can think, think of some sort of like a practical examples, like you mentioned, the async collaboration. That's definitely a challenge I've been having a lot. 
lately or even like involving the users where you cannot be with them like together in the same room, giving them the tools to interact, to get to know some new concepts or new products. So other, I mean, I don't have like specific question. This is the question you have to answer, but I definitely wanted to discuss this topic a bit more in details with you. Yeah. Let me, let me answer in three different ways. So one, I think you can see my bias towards like visual collaboration, (laughs) group facilitation. In fact, a lot more of my trainings and workshops these days are more about facilitation and how to do that, how to do that remotely. Um, so that's, that's, uh, I definitely want to call that. You saw that, right? Um, and that's kind of, as I was writing the book, and the book is like a seven year journey. <laughs> as I started the book, it was very much about data visualization and infographics, information design. And that's what the first probably two thirds of the book kind of is, is talking about. But as, as it went on, I realized like there's more to it. It's about bringing people together. Uh, it's not always me solving a problem by myself, for myself, or for others, is often I need knowledge from other people. And so the final third of the book uh, really gets into more of the stuff I focused on today, which is bringing people together. So that's that's one answer. If we talk specifically about UIs and things, so I'll be clear, like it's not a book on like how to do better form design or how to do better charts or how to do better data visualization. There, there are books on that, but what I do, I'm gonna share my screen again for a moment. Um, give me just a second here. Wanna, turn off a few things. All right, let's see, share my screen. Um, what I what I do in the book, uh, as far as like those tactical things is I do get into, okay, let's, let's get timeless and let's get thoughtful about it. And there's like a chapter on visual encodings. And so we talk about things like um, form line width or, or orientation of things or enclosure. And we talk about like, is that, is that better for representing categories? Is it better for general, precise quantitative perception or general quantitative perception, i.e. qualitative stuff? Or is it best for showing sequence? So it's it's kind of a, a, a more timeless way of thinking about how we use things like visual encodings, you know, hue, intensity, 2D position. And what I found in workshops over the years is that um, this is stuff a lot of designers kind of know intuitively even if we've never had a language for. So being able to share like a, a, a handout like this, is like, ah, this is this is how I've been thinking. I just, now <laughs> I have something to help me, right? And then for people who aren't designers who don't have the design background, this was like secret sauce, like, aha, I can think about design in a structured, you know, rational way. It makes sense why we would use color here instead of shape or whatever it might be. And you can apply that to any number of things. And the examples run from like, you know, some UI interface stuff, there's board game examples, right? Because again, these are about how humans perceive information. So that's that's kind of the more tactical uh, stuff you might get out of it. And then kind of in between, there's um, like there's a few chapters where I talk about how everything we think of uh, is really a prior association that's being activated. And I talk about how that shows up in our work. And so we have metaphors like... Um, the three-legged stool is a metaphor that's been around for at least 20 years, where you have, you know, business is one, you know, the focus of business and making money is one leg, the focus of customers, designers, users is, is a second leg, and the third leg is engineering viability, right? And, you know, implicit in that metaphor is like each role is unique. And then there's always the question, who's the stool, right? Like who <laughs> sits in the stool? And I've seen different answers. You move to something like a Venn diagram, and there's at least, unlike the three-legged stool, there's some overlap and concern, which is always a problem I had with the three-legged stool. It's a metaphor, but if it's the metaphor that shapes our thinking, then we think we're special and unique and no one else should do what we're doing, which I think is kind of flawed. And so the Venn diagram says, oh no, there's going to be some overlap and you know, there's going to be overlap in coding or overlap in who does user research. So, But there's still this part that's very exclusive. And if you're a designer, if you're an engineer, if you're a business person or a PM, like you, you think fundamentally different and have a different set of properties. And as I started thinking about this metaphor and how it shapes our thinking, our behaviors, I came up with this idea of a spotlight, where imagine if we're each a spotlight looking at the same problem from a different vantage point. And once I ran with that, I realized it got rid of, and let me go down to where I expanded it. It got rid of some of the exclusivity of the, the, the three-legged stool and the, the Venn diagram and said, okay, we all have a shared concern, but we represent a different perspective. So that's, that's takeaway number one. And then takeaway number two, I, I'm sure you've experienced this. You've probably met like like designers who are more business focused than they were design focused, or maybe you've met engineers who were like amazing designers. They just were in an engineering role, right? And what I love is you can start to say then, hey, I'm a very business-minded engineer. 
Um, so I'm an engineer and that's what I do, but I think a lot about the business concerns and that's cool, right? The model accommodates that and allow, it's more realistic, more honest in that way. And uh, no one needs to 100% follow a single mindset, but but we can true up to what is the engineering mindset that every project needs? What's the design mindset that every project needs? And what's the business mindset that every project needs? And I loved when I shared this, people started riffing on it and saying, oh yeah, I can think of a fourth light that's that's needed here, like the research perspective, for example, because it's different from these other three. And people started building on it. And the whole point there is to say, by thinking about this intentionally, you can become hyper aware of the connotations or the suggestions of the metaphors that we use and whether they're healthy for good teams or unhealthy. And I feel like there's some parts to the three-legged stool in the Venn diagram that are unhealthy that maybe we don't see. So hopefully that helps answer your question. That's great. No, this is a very great example. Um, of course, immediately I start thinking about how, how do you know what information makes sense? How do you know whether that's the right representation? How do you make sure everybody's aligned? Everybody has different those worlds and the understandings and how do you know for sure, you know, <laughs> validating this kind of representation. Um, again, I don't know if that's possible even to answer, but of course, those questions start coming up because you want to make sure you're applied further <laughs> moving forward. Yeah. I will, I will mention one example I opened the book with that's very popular. Um, I, I've, the times I've been to Israel previously, I've used this in, in talks and stuff. Let me, let me, I think, yep, I have it in the visual visual sketch notes here. I'll share my screen once more. Again, show stuff, right? Show, show things. Um, yeah, I opened this as an example. And this is going back to 2004. So this was, um, uh, yeah, if you, if, you, if you recognize this, it's, it's a chart that was given to us by the hospital when my oldest son, who's he's 21 now, but he was four at the time, he was diagnosed with type one diabetes or juvenile diabetes. And this was the form that would basically be placed on a refrigerator for the next several months and would tell us what to do at what time. And um, there's a lot more to it, but basically like you have to give a certain number of, uh, uh, you, you can only allow a certain number of carbs to come in. You have to give shots with insulin and you have to do it at certain times and your, your whole life becomes this routine. Um, I looked at this and the information design was, as I think many of you are <laughs> probably, probably confirmed, it's pretty atrocious. It's hard to make sense of. And so I did a kind of a makeover where, again, graphic design wise, this isn't the best. Like there's all sorts of things we could critique, but from an information design perspective, um, this is all the same information that was in this form. And it's been made over into something that my four-year-old could understand at that age and understand when to do which things and how much. And that was the whole goal was to make the information more understandable. And so that like the before and after is one thing, but understanding what did I do as a designer to get from this to this, I think that's, that's what I wanted to shine a light on. And it was really about looking at the information types, doing an inventory, arranging those things into like things, which in this case, it's sorted into time and type of things, like it was an easy thing. And then there's, there's a process that I, I believe anyone can do to get from things like this, which the world is filled with, right? To things like this, where maybe it's not the greatest graphic design, but it's better understanding. It creates understanding for folks. And there's other examples. Um, I don't know if it's here in this visual summary, but oh yeah, um, how people are solving the, uh, the parking signs, the parking problems where, um, uh, I, I don't know about where you live, but there are occasionally parking signs that, let me go, here's an exaggerated one, but parking signs where like, you pull up here and you're like, can I park here? Can I not? And all the information's there, right? but understanding is not present. And so I've seen a few solutions. Um, this was some, uh, some sort of guerrilla design uh, project that was started 10 years ago where someone would paste this on us on where one of those confusing signs was and ask, you know, is this easier to understand? And I love the comments. This is awesome. The mayor should hire you. Good. I like this. And uh, there are a few cities that have started redesigning their parking schedule. So instead of something like this, you know, on the left here, which is confusing, they've used something that looks more like a calendar and aids understanding and cognition. Um, and by the way, this example I mentioned later in the book because there are other solutions we can employ, um, such as this one here. This is a, a concept a designer came up with where instead of having to make sense of it, what if you just pointed an app at the sign and the app would tell you, yes, you can park here, no, you can't. Um, I applaud the creativity of this. The context in which I share it 
is, uh, is one of concern, in which case these are both solutions to the problem of the confusing parking sign, but this one creates understanding where understanding may be needed. This one, you get the understanding, but you don't have, sorry, this one you get on the right, you get the answer, but you don't have understanding for why you got the answer. And it, it's a stupid, simple example of street signs, but as we entrust more to machine learning algorithms, um, what kinds of things are we just gonna trust an answer for? And when should we use machine learning to not get an answer, but get understanding? And I definitely am the camp of like, let's use technology to extend our cognitive abilities, not to off offshore or outsource our, our cognitive abilities. Sorry, different so topic there. Examples. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure also Vitaly wanted to ask something. At yes. least he mentioned he had questions. <laughs> yes, I actually was really, really inspired. Stephen, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, actually, I love this example about parking stalls. I have written now like four or five other questions as well. And we have a lot of questions coming in the chat too. But I'm wondering, it's always something that's been kind of, it's, it's, it's always really the difficult part for me. So once you have this problem with parking slots, you need to arrive at the solution somewhere. And there are plenty of solutions and some of them are really, really great. So how do you do that? I mean, we often think about, you know, when we're dealing with organizations, especially large organizations, there is this notion, well, I'm not creative. I'm not, you know, I'm not born for this. I, 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 I'm, you know, th this kind of things. But you need to take the problem and then come to the solution. Can you maybe just drive us through the path that you would normally take to yeah. solve a problem like that and yeah. reach at a solution or a number of solutions? Yeah, and I don't know that there's always one path. Uh, <laughs> it varies. There are plenty, but, I'm sure. But, you know, and, and I'm going to sound like a facilitator talking right now, but I think it's for each step of the path, you need to figure out what do we need to know next or lock in next or agree on next or get the answer to next and then figure out the exercise or the activity to get there. And, and I guess, I know there's, I, I know about you, but if, I've looked back periodically and look at moments that shape my career as a designer. And one of those is going back to early 2000s. Um, I had the fortune to work with a researcher um, or designer who had gone through um, in the States, the Illinois Institute of Design program, which had a heavy focus on participatory design and user research. And what I learned from him and saw modeled was he would, um, every, every step of the way, when he'd come up with a new idea for what it was like a branding you know, proposal or a new form or whatever, he'd put the ideas on the wall where everyone had to walk by and ask people to, to give feedback and collaborate. And implicit in that was, um, I think there's two ways of working as, uh, as designers. One is to do all the work like at our desktop on our own and then come back for the big reveal. And this has been you know, pounded into us from agencies and the advertising world, right? Three options, you pick one. Um, I don't have a lot of confidence in that model. I think the model that invites people into the design process uh, creates the structure where all people can contribute um, in effective ways and, and they're there along the way is actually healthier because then there's no big reveal. You just work your way towards the right solution. And so what, yeah, whatever, to go back to your question, whatever, um, whatever you need to do to bring the right people in and the right people will vary, right? And I'll give you an example in a moment, bring the right people along and, and lock in or get the answer to the next piece of information you need, I think, I think is key. And, um, I'll share an example right now that's happening. We're, we're working on something really progressive and out there at Mural. Like I work in kind of the innovation labs group and we're working on something kind of out there. And we're engaging with research now to start to, to help it shape, uh, take shape. And our initial contact with the, the head of research or the, the research we're working with, um, she came back with like a kind of a cookie cutter thing that had been tailored. And we looked and we're like, I don't think that's right for this project. It's more of an innovation project. We don't, you know, like it's, it's not, it's the wrong fit. And so what we did is we stopped and said, what are the questions we as the design team most need answers to right now? Like that would help us. And so we were borrowing more from like lean design and like the startup methods, like what are the biggest unknowns or the biggest blockers? And, and we brainstormed those, we kind of sequenced them. We met again with the researcher and she's like the light bulb click. She's like, oh, this is awesome. And we've got several research projects now going and, um, but it started from that, what is it that we need to answer now? What's the most important question? And that yielded then the process and the method. And so, um, yeah, all of that to say, I think at each step along the way, figure out what's the most important thing we need to do or answer or clarify and who needs to be involved. 
And um, with that research project, there's another reason I mentioned it is um, this isn't the first time I've done research like this. And we often talk, treat research candidates as one and the same, right? But I've started looking less at role and um, more at mindset. And so for an innovative project like this, early on when things are fuzzy and there's a lot more hand-waving, we need people who are more visionary in their mindset and can see possibilities and see past all the 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 stuff that's work in progress and um and then what we what we don't need early on are the people who are like hey there's a period missing there like why is it we're like like we may delete the whole book right we don't know like but so we need people who are visionary and uh can see big ideas up front but then as we go on people who have that more narrow focus and the detail focus they're going to be more detail focused right yeah mm, so it's really yeah. about sequencing who needs to be involved at which point in time uh which is a little bit different and again it all goes back to the questions we have, the objectives we're after, those types of things. Right, that makes sense. I mean, I have more questions, but Anfisa, would you like to take over the next one? Well, I would, let, let me go first, because I, sure. I don't know if I have a question, but I have also like a topic, but uh, let's, let's get to it back later. All right, all right. Um, so um, I'll then ask another one if that's if that's okay, and then we can also dive into some questions that actually came up in the chat. Uh, I love this idea of holding information and finding kind of a frame or something that actually holds it. And that example with the chessboard is just brilliant. Uh, I'm wondering, and this is where I stuck all the get stuck all the time. Uh, the information is somehow flow kind of flowing from one person to another in a conversation in a communication, but then it just disappears. It just disappears in the thin air. And so it seems to me like th this notion, we actually kind of with COVID now, we got used to the fact that we can record our conversations and then get back to them. And I love this so much. This is so great. I mean, I actually keep going to conversations. Does anybody else in the chat, please let me know if they do that as well. So you just replay the Zoom recording with like 1.5 or 2.0 speed. And then you just have everything. That's just incredible. I mean, for me, this is just magical, right? Um, I still feel, though, very often that somehow when people are talking, there is something is still missing. Like you're still kind of maybe talking about the same thing, but it seems like you have alignment, but something is still, you know, kind of over time as the project progresses, you realize something is still missing. I'm, we're still not, not really aligned. So maybe you have some tools or something that kind of helps you to just make really sure that when you're talking about something, when you have a meeting or anything, that you're kind of documenting everything, maybe visually, right? Mm -hmm. In a way that it just manifests itself for good. Just a good example from my end, one thing that I started doing is um, creating a Google Doc for every person I'm speaking to. And so it's just notes, 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 notes. So over time, as we keep speaking about anything, it's kind of, it's kind of an ongoing history. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously you can do that with Zoom as well, but maybe you have better ideas for that. Yeah, so I think you're you're just going back to the the setting for your question. You're hitting on something that I think we as designers and and people working in tech should all be paying attention to right now, which is I think uh, with the acceleration into distributed, remote, online working, um, you do see more people like in the chat. Like, there's great questions. I'm going to mm -hmm. save this chat before I go because there's good questions for me to reflect on. Right? There's links that have been shared. There's information that's. Um, if compared to like an in-person conference, someone may have asked, may have asked a good question that there, then it slipped away. Right. So there's a record of information that I think is really amazing. And I've been in a number of meetings where like this chat happening at the same time was as valuable, if not more than, uh, what was happening on the screen. And, um, and I think there's something to like, that's a new opportunity. Um, you also mentioned watching things back at 1.5. I think that too, when we talk about asynchronous work. Uh, but that's something we're trying to develop internally and help our companies develop. And we use tools like Loom to do short, quick recordings. Then people can watch it back at 1.5 or 1.7, depending on how slow or quickly the person speaks. And um, it's a great way, um, if you nurture the culture, if you change the culture, it's a great way to share information in a different way. Um, going back directly to your question, though, I think, yeah, ma definitely making things visual is key. That removes a lot of the uncertainty learning how to use tools for decision-making or agreement. Um, there's a number of facilitation tools to do that, I think is also needed. Um, one thing, so 
go to rant for a moment. One thing that drives me nuts is the misuse or abuse of dot voting. I don't know if anyone's ever been in a workshop where you brainstorm and uh, then everyone dot votes. And clearly what got the most votes is the best idea, right? And it's like, no, it's not, right? It's it's the one that was most easily understood or the most popular or the most whatever, right? And um, so I don't ever use dot voting to make decisions. I use dot voting to like facilitate a dialogue and drive discussion. Um, but uh, there's a recent meeting I was in with uh, 17 execs, like, you know, heads of a company. And um, one of the things I did at the beginning of the workshop, and I repeat at the end, is I use this exercise called fist to five. I don't know if anyone's heard of this, but basically in, in, in real life or in physical space, you would have everyone on the count of three hold up either a fist, one finger, two fingers, three fingers, four fingers, or five. And what that expresses is fist means like, I can't get behind this at all. Like I will, I, no support. Um, one is like, okay, I think this is the wrong idea. I don't think what's what we should be doing as a company, but for the sake of unity, I would go along, but I want it to be a record that I didn't think it was a great idea. And you can imagine it goes up from there and five is like, this is awesome. This is the best thing ever. This is, I, I'm full support. And um, I ran this workshop at the beginning and most people were like twos and a few threes. And then there was like one five, which was the CEO, which was, which was great, right? To get that information out. And at the end, we ran it again and it was People had moved a lot of the twos had shifted the threes, which was good because two or less means there's a lack of consensus, but three or more, it means there's some shared consensus. And it was just a little a technique or a tool I picked up a few years ago. It was a lot better than the binary, like thumbs up, thumbs down. It was more, it allows people to express nuance and say things like, I disagree with this, but I'll go along with it. But I want to go on record as thinking this was a bad idea, right? Or whatever it may be. And so I think learning to collect tools like that, whether it's a a framework or a card deck or activities, um, techniques that help facilitate that consensus and decision-making. I think that's um, that's something we need to work on and do a lot more of. And um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think at this point, I'm just going to order your book and I highly recommend everyone who is joining in the chat to do the same thing as well. <laughs> just saying, and I think Anfisa did it already. So that's uh, good for you, Anfisa. I don't um, even know how it how, how it happened. I got it in May when it was just released, and I don't know why it happened. I didn't know it was just out. But that's cool. That's really cool to know that um, to see that we're doing it today. Um, can I can I do the follow up question because the topic you just tapped on was really interesting to me, and I had like something along the same lines. Couldn't formulate it clearly because it's very abstract. But the question is. Basically, you know, you were talking a little about, you know, okay, so if I was not in a meeting or if I was in the meeting, but I wasn't fully presented, I could record and watch it back and stuff like that. But again, this is about creating shared knowledge altogether. But there are moments when you want to involve people that don't have the same shared knowledge. There are moments when people didn't see this recording or people who misunderstood the information that were presented. And then we get together to, obviously right now we work in like stages. We cannot have this design sprint in the same room <laughs> most of the times. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you move from one exercise to another and all together the same, like being on the same page, you actually have this shared knowledge. So usually what happens today is that even though we assume we all have some sort of shared information, we maybe have had some homework to do, we maybe have seen some video recording, we may have seen some links around, but we all come to those meetings probably still having different understandings and different, I guess, depths of knowledge. And that's where, I guess, my biggest today when I imagine the workshops we have where I see a lot of gaps and misunderstanding and we spend more time trying to make sure we're talking about the same things because maybe some other team member have put together this Jira page and it's very abstract and you thought you knew what you were talking about but you're not now mm -hmm. so it's all very confusing sometimes especially now working all remote and I, I guess the question is is there a way to make sure we are same on the same page and we're aligned is it even important maybe it's okay to be all misaligned but it kind of gives different perspectives you know to the projects you're working on what's your take on this <laughs> yeah yeah so I'm, I'm I'm glad you asked that because it's uh just make doing things in a workshop doesn't make things better, right? You've got to do it well, just like, you know, everything, okay. right? Um, and I don't know, I'm going to lean a bit on like, like methods from coaching, like in counseling, um, like in counseling, when two people have a disagreement, 
you know, there's the, there's the activity where the counselor will ask, or the therapist will ask one person to restate what they think the other person said and vice versa. I think we can do similar types of things in our workshops. We're like, all right, we're, this is day two of whatever, before we get started, I want everyone to state back what they heard yesterday. Um, or end of the day, I want everyone to summarize what you think you heard or what you saw today or what stood the top three things that stood out for you. And those um, sort of check in or check out moments are a great way to see, um, were we in the same meeting? Did we pick up on the same things? And and based on how people respond, you know, if you have 20 people and they all kind of are echoing the same things, you're great, right? But if you end up with very different things, you can you can say, all right, pause before we roll into our next activity. Let's let's talk about this because I don't think we're on the same page and you can have that dialogue then. And um, yeah, so simple check-in, check-out activities are great uh, like that. And that comes, by the way, from from teaching uh, way back when I was a high school English teacher. And so I still follow like what's happening with K through 12 education. And, um, you know, after teaching or doing a unit for an hour, having students do a simple two quiz thing to check out is a great way to check for understanding and see did everyone get what we're talking about? Are we all on the same page? And um, I've done similar things in my workshops and where I'll just ask a simple question like that, re reflect back what you heard. And it's a good way to make sure people are on the same page and they understood um, what was shared or discussed and that there is consensus or, or at least if not consensus, at least everyone understands what the problem is and agrees on that. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I, I love this idea <laughs> to try making sure everybody's aligned, though. Um, it's hard. Think, it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we, we, we tend to forget about it. We tend to assume everybody's aligned. <laughs> and then, like you mentioned in this picture, uh, everybody have different shapes in their heads. <laughs> um, I think given the time, we can actually take one or two questions from the audience at this point. Uh, so you guys, if you have any questions, make sure to drop it right now. Um, I will scroll up a little bit. And and, and um, there was this question, I believe, by Alice Peggio. She asked, um, what if, so what, how do you communicate to your, I guess, collaborators that it's not about creativity, but about collaboration, because there's this notion or assumption that if you participate, you have to be creative, you probably have to draw something. And uh, I mean, we're talking about workshops, I assume. But, um, but I guess the question here is how to make people understand that collaborating is not about being creative or creativity itself? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the best thing is just for people to experience it firsthand and not even talk about, are you creative? Or are you not? It just do an exercise where everyone gets the chance to be. And um, I don't know. I, I I think, so I know about, about all of you listening, but um, I know for a long time, I was like, what's the big deal with design thinking? Like, it just seemed like a bunch of hype. I didn't get it. And um, in recent years, I've been leading design thinking workshops and training. And I'm reminded that I think it's something, it's just a way of working that if you're a designer, um, we take for granted. It's just like, well, why wouldn't we work? Like, how else would you work, right? But there are still people, um, even people close, to, like in adjacent fields like engineering, who will go through a design thinking workshop for the first time in their life. And like, I've never, I've never thought about like interviewing the customer to get like the the requirements like that. And, you know, and like that was transformative. And I've never thought about flaring and focusing or following a double diamond or, you know, whatever jargon we're using. And um they will come out of that workshop saying that was that was amazing. I want to do more of like that on my team. To which we're like, yes, that's why we did this, right? Um, but yeah, I think there's just so much we take for granted, just ways of working that when other people are exposed to, they're like, yes, that's that makes sense. That's what I've been looking for. I want to do more of that. Um, and you never have to talk about are you creative or not. Or how, you just create the space for people to be what we are as humans. And and um, small disclaimer, there are some people who've had creativity beat out of them by ways of working and things going all the way back to early childhood education, like ways of teaching but or being taught. But uh, I don't know if you can figure out how to create the space and then create the right nudges that get people to be to true up to their creative selves. I think we're all creative, right? It's just we got to reawaken that in a lot of folks. Yeah, thanks a lot for answering. Um... And, and I agree, I guess I can even remember where I was like 
the way for me to transition to UX design was to actually accidentally being pulled over to the hackathon by my friend. I was like, mm -hmm. not sure what it is, like, what? well, let's do it. And then by being sort of immersed into all this creativity and brainstorming and different people sharing different perspectives, it was just amazing. And that's how you definitely get more excited about it and realize that that's actually a great thing. It's not about making beautiful pictures, I guess. Yep. <laughs> Um, but anyways, here's another question you'll get in the chat, um, which is asked by Anelia. And she's asking, what would be the first step you would recommend a company should take to introduce, I guess, the narrative we have all here today uh, for the first time? Mm, I, I think without more research, it'd be hard to answer that, generally yeah. speaking. Um, I... Again, I, I'm just going to get an answer. I don't know if it's even remotely right, but I think just starting small, like I, I'm a big, big believer in being able to change things from the inside out or the middle out. Um, you know, company orgs will often set an agenda and there's hierarchy and power structures that we can't fight. But what we can change is like, okay, the team I'm on, how do we work? What's our mindset? And so, um, uh, you know, bringing in some some ways of working that draw from facilitation methods or workshop activities and just saying, hey, um, this meeting you know, that we usually have every week, I'd like to run it a bit different week this week. Can I try that? And, and doing that, I think can be powerful. And there I read story, I hear of stories every day of like, you know, someone who's gone to a meeting, a regular weekly meeting. It's just so boring. It's it's that meeting A type where someone's just lecturing and they'll say, hey, could I could I lead the next one? And and usually the person who normally leads it's like, yeah, please do, right? And what they do is they do something that's more active. They start with a goal, a stated, here's why we're meeting, here's what we want to do. Um, so I think, yeah, and again, it depends on what the meeting is and what the focus is, but bringing in some of that space to collaborate and have a dialogue and do more of that meeting B type of things, um, that's something any of us can do. You know, and it, it it's a muscle. It's going to take practice, right, to get it right. But um, sometimes the bar is so low that bringing in just a little bit of collaboration can go a long way. Yeah, great tip. And actually, it's actually kind of connected to the next question we have in the chat, asked by Yara. Yara, I don't know how to spell it. Uh, so how can I simplify complex info on a daily basis collaboratively? Uh, most of these examples were for a workshop. Any tips? So it's, again, it's more about how do we practice it on a daily basis? Yeah. And I would say um, I'm going to I'm gonna try to tear down this distinction between a workshop and meetings. Um, the training I give, I call it everyday facilitation. And the idea is um, the same things that make someone a great facilitator in a workshop could also make us great at just facilitating everyday meetings. And um you know, and simple things like, why are we here? What do we hope to get out of it? What's the, what's the obje objective or outcome? Um, how have we structured things to happen? I think there's this idea that we just get people together and magic will happen. And it does in very rare instances. And, it, and those rare instances are where people in the meeting already have a way of working that's very collaborative. Um, so I think in many cases, you have to think about the meeting you're going into, even if it's a 30 minute one, right? Or an hour one. And how can I design this meeting to be more effective and accomplish what we want. And, and some, it's not always one meeting, it may be a whole series of them. Um, it may not be in person, it may be asynchronous and watch this loom and then that'll unlock this next thing that you can add comments to. And you know, what, you know, uh, my big challenge, what I would love to see everyone do is take our design skills um, and channel them at like designing for dialogue and designing for behavior and designing for, um, you know, creating understanding in the workspace. Like it's, none of this happens by accident. It has to be designed. I think, I think designers more than most professions are primed to be great facilitators, whether it's facilitating directly or um, creating the toolkits, the card decks, the canvases that allow people to self-facilitate or facilitate with a little bit of, of uh, facilitation in the background. Yeah, it feels like we need another role on <laughs> the market. Focus particularly on making sure everybody is always aligned and informed and uh, collaborating. That's great. Um, I guess we have a last question for today on the chat, and then we'll probably start wrapping it up. Uh, but um, I guess the question is, how do we convince the boss? Sometimes it's hard when the boss is... Um, it, 
is in his own like basically he's condensing something else or he's in his own line of thoughts um any tips there <laughs> yeah um two thoughts so one i always crew it back up to the objectives or the outcomes what are we after um and that whether it's more complex decisions like i'm talking about now or going back 15 years ago when you debate about whether the button should be one shade of pink or green or what have you um i always tried tried to drive it back to what's the objective what do we want to have happen and you know like with the button i'd always ask do you want more people to click on the button or no right and they would say well more obviously more you're like great well we did some tests and we saw that more people click on this button so we can go with the button you like but it actually doesn't accomplish what you're after right so so all of that to say i think truing up to an objective um and making a, a shared objective or some shared measure i think that always sets the stage and then for for whatever methods or however we get there that said i will say sometimes whether people will admit it or not they just want the button they want um even if it doesn't get the thing that they also say they're after and you've got to learn to recognize when someone just doesn't want to collaborate they just want to tell people what to do and yeah you know, i'd like to say they'll come around at some point it just you might have to wait or you might have to work on them it's it's a long game yeah yeah but all of that to say like don't don't go <laughs> walk away from the saying yeah steven just heard this and try it out and like ah oh, that person just didn't like my ideas like sometimes you know, it takes a while for people to see that okay, I, I need to back off a bit and maybe trust the team more, or, you know, whatever it may be, or I need to figure out how to give them more constructive feedback that they can act on versus just telling them what to do. And so, yeah, yeah, or just kind of nudging them towards figuring it out themselves, yep, yep. <laughs> making sure that that's their decision rather than yours. So it's it's also like a definitely like a skill or a magic skill you have to hone <laughs> in your experience and your practice. I love that you said that and make it feel like it was their idea. That's something, I think that's key. Like when you see someone saying something like, yeah, people want to be encouraged for their ideas, yeah. no matter what level, like people want to feel validated. And so um, when, when that thing that you want to see more of, or you want to see grow is, is stated, lean into that and say, that, that's exactly what you said. That's awesome. How could we do more of that? And then use that as the opening to, to start talking about yep. the, the behaviors you're after. Totally. It's, uh, yeah. it's positive regard because, uh, you know, it's like you in kids, we see the thing, the behavior we want. And we're like, I loved it when you did that. You know, that was so amazing. And the kids are like, Ooh, if I do more of that, I'll get more of that you know, <laughs> feedback, positive yep. feedback. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, I think there are a lot of people in the chat who wants to know what is your favorite board game, and that would be literally the closing question for today. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know if I can pick a favorite. I will say uh, my board game group, we've been playing a lot of Dune Imperium lately. Um, it's kind of a, a worker placement deck building game, if you're familiar with those, those mechanic, those terms. But yeah, it's based on the movie Dune, the book Dune. And uh, uh, I have way too many board games. I had not planned on buying any more, but then I saw the movie, loved the movie Dune. Um, it inspired me to go read the book, which I've never done, and buy a board game so we could continue feeling like we're in that world. And uh, it's a wonderful game. It's, it's a lot of fun. Great one. I haven't heard of a game. <laughs> okay, that's a lot. <laughs> okay, great. Thank um, you. Um, thank I you. guess that would be good for just, today. Uh, Vitaly, do you have a last question before we end it up? That's the last well, one. Yes, maybe the last one. I, that's okay, Steven, with you. The future, the future is here. So we're now in 2022. What do you expect to kind of uh, to come on the design landscape? Is there anything that we should be expecting coming from Ural maybe? Or just what you see? Like where, what, what should we be expecting from the future? Can you just grab your crystal ball and look what's <laughs> in there? Um, so I will say, give a plug, final plug for the book. The final chapter takes everything that, the previous 14 chapters write about and says, what could happen in the future? And I think a lot of the things that I'm thinking about in my role at Mural are a lot of the things that I write about at the end, but it's, it's, um, I, I, I know I get excited when I think about information, not being trapped behind one screen or one interface, but being spread into the environment around us and, uh, how do we interact with it? So I think what, I mean, we're talking not 2022, but like decades out, but the work that Brett Victor is doing with Dynamic Land is just amazing and inspiring. I think it's dynamicland.org if you want to check that out more. Um, I really, when you talk about complex problems, um, I'm also super inspired by the work that, uh, uh, 
I say their name all the time. Now it's, I'm blinking. Um, Nikki Cage does all the time with these explorable explanations. And I love the idea that you can play with something that feels like a game or a simulation and come out the other side with a deeper understanding of a really complex topic. I think that's powerful. I love the visual parts of, of both explorable explanations and dynamic land. I'm also um, non-visual at all, but I'm keeping my eyes on uh, a lot of what's happening with Rome obsidian and these second brain, you know, um, knowledge graph tools, because I think there's something powerful there that's, that's, it's like we're finally realizing uh, things that seeds that were planted 50 years ago in like the late 1960s with computer science, um, with how do we, how do we make, how, how do we truly create a bicycle for the mind to use the Steve Jobs quote? How do we make the computer something that makes our brains better and more powerful? And I think that that group's exploring it. Um, I look at it, what everything that's happening with notes and, and note taking and backlinks, and I say, great. How can you merge that with visual and make it more even more powerful? Yes. Well, that's as long as we didn't hear anything about spreadsheets and Google Docs <laughs> being the future, I'm pretty happy. So that makes me a little bit happy. Well, that's that was the last question from me, Avi. Uh, Nikki Case. Um, let me see if I can find that. I saw just saw the chat. Nikki Case. Yeah, um, Nicholas Cage, not not to be, yeah, in case.me. Let me let me just paste the link in here in the chat. And uh, yeah, there's some inspiring stuff in there. There you go. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Anfisa. Thank you, Vitaly. It was uh, a great. I think the time went so quickly. Uh, and uh, we don't have time to do the networking, unfortunately, but uh, it was really, really cool. Um, hope to see you next time. I will send everyone the email, uh, all the links uh, that we discussed. This video is also going to be in that email. We can, uh, you can see it on YouTube again and watch it in uh, fast motion and uh, enjoy it again. So again, thanks everyone for being here and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks Thank everyone. You. Thanks, Bye. Stephen. Bye-bye everyone.